I want to tell you the story of when death was arrested in my life and when I saw the light. I'm a girl who's just from right here in town. I, was, I went to Bath High School. <laughs> and I grew up in a super, super normal family. I want to tell you that as a little girl, I just thought life could not have been more idyllic, really. I had a mom who was the church pianist, and I had a dad who was in charge of everything for the Sunday school at our church. And I'm going to tell you, when we... When we were involved in church, I mean, we were involved in church. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, if there was a church work day, if there was a carry-in, our family was there. And I was the youngest of five daughters, and life was good. And then one day when I was in the seventh grade, my dad came to me and he said, Honey, I love you. You know how much I love you, but I want to tell you I don't love your mother anymore and I'm leaving. And now to a girl who had never even really heard her parents argue, I mean, I had no idea whatsoever. I was blown out of the water. How could this family that followed Jesus and were in the church all the time and involved and things looked like they were going so good, how could everything fall apart like that? I was so blindsided. And so my dad left. He didn't divorce my mom, but he left. He took off for Texas. He lived there for a while. He lived in Indiana for a while. And so that left kind of a vacuum in my life. And, you know, I'm, absolutely we all make our own choices. There's no question in that. But this all took place when, you know, those early teen years were going on, were going on for me. And... There was this overriding question that just come, kept coming back to me. You know, we had issues at home. That was hard. And, but then I had my own issues. And the, and the issue that I had was this question that just would not leave me. And that question was always, what will people think? And so when this took place in our family, I remember being so embarrassed because, you know, we were this picture of really perfection, I thought. And what were people going to think? And so as a girl who was super involved in her youth group, you know, I was involved in Bible quizzing, and I, I sang in church and all those things. I, I cared about what people thought at church, but I'll tell you what, I really cared about what people thought at school. And so that began a life for me of living two different identities. And I, there was the school Amy, and there was the church Amy. And I did a really good job, I'll tell you, of making sure that people could, in the right spot, they, they would see what I wanted them to see. And you know how a chameleon will, will take on the colors of his environment and he'll blend right in? That's exactly what I did. And so when I was at school, I talked like they did. I did the things they did. When I was at church, you know, I was a church girl and I did all those things that I thought, you know, I was supposed to do. And so when the opportunity came to me, as it always does, you know, do you, do you want to take a drink? And sure, because if I didn't, what would people think? What would my friends think? So I began to drink. And then when the question came, did I want to have sex? I thought, well, what's he going to think if I say no? And so, of course, I said yes. And you guys, I'm here to tell you today that that question ruled my life so much that I willingly gave away the most beautiful gift that God, one of the most beautiful gifts that God gives to us, and that was I gave away the gift of my virginity. That gift that I was supposed to keep for my husband for our wedding night. I gave that away on homecoming night in the back seat of a car. And after that time, you know, I thought there was so much shame because, you know, I'm still going to church, and I know the way. But that guilt was just overwhelming me. And at the same time, I thought, well, you know, you're ruined. Satan will tell you things. He'll whisper things in your ear. And that was one of those things that Satan just kept telling me, you're ruined. 
And what does it matter if you have sex again? Because you've given away that gift. You can never get it back. And so I began a life of, of sleeping around. I was so promiscuous. And yet I would, I would go off on Saturday night and I would get drunk and I, would, and I would sneak back into the house, and then I would go to church on Sunday morning. And I would put on that happy face, and I would act like everything was fine, and that I was this good Christian girl. And these lives of these two Amys, it, it just continued and it continued until I was at a conference. I was at a youth conference very much like this, and I thought I was pregnant. And I thought, oh, Lord, you know, it's in those days. Have you guys ever been there? Where he said, you've, you've done a lot of, of dealing with the Lord, saying, you get me out of this situation, God, and I promise, I absolutely give you my word, I will never do that again, not ever. I will walk away from that. I repent. I'm so sorry. I mean, my back was up against a wall. And so I prayed that, and, and sure enough, I, I wasn't pregnant. I'm ashamed to tell you it didn't take very long until that wore off and those promises were very faint in my mind and I was right back at it again. Until the day came when I was pregnant and that test did come back positive. And I thought, what will people think? Well, when you're the president of your church youth group and you're on the National Honor Society and you're a cheerleader and you're in track and you're singing at church, how does that kind of a person have a baby? And so, and so I thought I had no option. I thought I've got to hide my sin. And so I made a, a decision to take the life of my child rather than let people know that sin that was going on in my life. And at that time in the state of Ohio, it was illegal to have an abortion. It wasn't illegal in Michigan. So I got in my car and I drove to Michigan and I walked into an abortion clinic and within a very short period of time, about an hour's time, doctor walked in. And I'm not going to color, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm just going to say what happened. That doctor vacuumed that first child of mine out of my body. The pain in that moment, physically, was horrible but I need to tell you the pain in that moment emotionally and spiritually didn't even compare and yet I thought I didn't have a choice because I had to hide my sin what would people think so I drove back to Ohio and and made up a lie to my mom about you know where I'd been and and then went to church the next day. No one knew. It'd been a success, and I had hidden my sin. I want to fast forward now to, now I'm a married woman, and I've met a wonderful man. His name's Jeff, and we're married, and all I could think about was, I want to have a baby. Because from the moment that I had that abortion, Satan said to me, you know what? It doesn't matter that you've repented. Because I'll tell you, I did repent. And I did ask God's forgiveness. And I was torn up with grief over what I'd done. And now my life has changed, and I'm following the Lord. But this voice just kept telling me, you know what? You're going to be punished for what you've done, and you're never going to be able to have a child. God's not going to allow that because of what you did. That child that you killed is the only child that you will ever have. And that haunted me. Over and over and over I heard that in my head. And so when we got married, I thought, I, I've, I've got I've to have a child. I've got to have a child. And so we started to try. And it was about two years worth of trying. And every month I would think, well, of course I'm not going to get pregnant because I'm never going to get pregnant. 
because God's going to punish me for what I've done. And so the day came, and that test came back positive, and I was pregnant. And I thanked the Lord so much. I thought, he, it's okay. He, he did forgive me. And then it was just a few weeks in, and the bleeding started. And before long, I'm on a doctor's table. And again, I'm just going to tell you like it was. There's blood running all down the table. And he says to me, I'm so sorry. You've miscarried. And I thought, well, of course I've miscarried. Because God's got to punish me for what I've done. He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put you in the hospital overnight. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to do a procedure. It's called a DNC. We're going to clear you out. And I'm sure there will be other children. And I sobbed that entire night. And I, I remember laying there thinking of the irony of that. Years before, I had paid money so that someone would take a child from me. And now I laid there pleading with God for forgiveness for what I'd done, realizing that I, I had lost a child that I would give anything to have. So the next morning, I'm on a gurney, and I'm being wheeled into um, the OR, and the doctor says to me, um, he's in full scrubs, and he says, hey, you know what, We're, right before, um, it's customary for me to do an ultrasound, and I just want to go in there and look at everything, and, and then we'll, we'll go in and we'll get the procedure started. And as he's doing the ultrasound, he looks at me and he says, there's a baby. And I said, what? I had miscarried a twin, but there was still a baby left inside of me that I had almost just accidentally, we had almost just accidentally aborted her. If he had not felt called to do that ultrasound before, this second child of mine would have inadvertently been taken from me. And so my pregnancy was very full the rest of the way of of a lot of issues and bleeding and bed rest and all those kinds of things. But on August 5th, God blessed my husband and I with our, with our child. Her name was Sarah, and she was healthy and perfect. And then it was just two years later that I found out I was, I was pregnant again. And the bleeding started and the issues started, and I thought, I have one. You know, I, I, I know, I know that God, God has been so good to me, and he's allowed me to have one. And then about four and a half months into it, we find out that we're having twins for the second time. I'm on bed rest again. And then on July 6th, God allows us to have two beautiful, healthy daughters. And I want you to know that so many years I spent my life seeing our Father as a punisher, seeing our Father as someone who, who when we sin, there's going to be punishment to come. I didn't see him as a healer. And even as a Christian woman, I didn't see him as someone who wanted to walk me through the dark days of my life and hold me and get me through it and bring redemption to my life. I didn't see that. I saw him as someone who was going to still, even though he'd forgiven me, and I believed that he had forgiven me. I did. But I believed that there was so much uh, darkness in my sin. I mean, I, I, how do you kill your own child, and how does God forgive that? And even though I, I knew in my head he did, I truly didn't know in my heart. I want you to know that secret sin will eat you alive. Asking the question over and over to yourself, what will people think? What will people think? It ruins lives. But our God is here today, and he wants to, he wants to take you from that secret sin. He wants you to know his redemption. He wants you to know that he's not a punisher, he is a healer. And how to end in my home 
Well, um, I want to go backwards now. My dad um, was out of our home for seven years. And during that time, uh, my, mom didn't, my mom did not divorce him. He had found another woman and um, lived, lived a separate life from us, but then would come home sometimes uh, on the weekend, and he would send money back. And, and so we continued during those years to go to church. But yet, it was still this kind of double life where on the outside we were looking like things were okay when things were really falling apart. And so one day my mom, I think she just couldn't take it anymore. My dad had come back, and uh, we were acting like everything was fine. And with my sister, my two sisters and my dad in the room, my mom just grabbed a bottle of pills. She'd, she had been taking Valium just to kind of get through these years. She grabbed that Valium and she started to just take that as fast as she could. My one sister grabbed her arm and my dad grabbed her arm and there's, you know, call the rescue squad and all these things. The rescue squad came and they took my mom and she was in St. Rita's. She was on the psychiatric ward for five weeks. And during that time, I would hear, I would hear the, them talking, you know, you, as, a, as a kid you hear the adults talking and they would say, she's saying she's going to do it again when she gets out. And I was so overcome with fear that, you know, I'd pretty much lost my dad and now I was going to lose my mom. My mom got out and my dad left again. And then finally, one day, my dad just decided he was going to come home. And it was about three years that my dad lived in our house. And when he came home, we started going back to church again. But I got to tell you, my dad was in our home, but he was, his only, only his body was in our home. His heart was not in our home. And so the day came that, that we were at church and I had the privilege of watching my dad go to the altar and ask the Lord forgiveness for everything for all those years. I talked to my mom yesterday and I said, Mom, how did you get through those years? She said, a lot of prayer. She said, our church family you know, loved us through those days. And, and she just, she, ne she didn't give up. She didn't give up. She believed that God could redeem what seemed hopeless. My dad died about um, five years ago. And on my dad's deathbed, he had cancer. I had the privilege to get to talk to my dad. And with tears streaming down his face, he said, I love you so much. And I said, I love you so much, Dad. He said, I love your mother so much. He said, she's forgiven me of so much. You know, the Bible says that the one who has been forgiven much loves much. And that's exactly what he did. My mom told me yesterday that from the day he walked to that altar until the day that our Savior took him home to heaven, that not one day did they ever speak of those years. Not one. Because when God forgives, he forgets. He promises to throw our sin in the sea of forgetfulness. And even in my own life, I just kept thinking that sin was before him all the time. That sin of my abortion and all those things I'd done was before him all the time. And, and also, when you don't tell others what you're going through, people can't speak truth into you. People can't speak life into you. There was no one telling me, Amy, that's not true. Satan is the father of lies. He is the deceiver, and he wants you to keep your sin secret. He wants to speak lies into your life. He doesn't want you to know what the truth is. The truth was that God had forgiven me. The truth was God forgave my dad. 
God gave my mom the ability to never speak of that again and for them to go forward and to grow in Christ. And my dad died just days shy of their 60th wedding anniversary. You guys, that's the God I serve. I serve a God who puts marriages back together. I serve a God who takes young girls who have no value and gives them value. I serve a God who takes secret sin and speaks life and truth into that and brings forgiveness and redemption. And you know, the Bible tells us that our Savior is no respecter of persons. And that means what he will do for me, he will do for you. And I don't know what you're dealing with, but I want to ask you today, what's your secret? I want you to take a minute right now, and I want you to ask yourself that. What's your secret? What is the thing that you think is so deep and so dark that God can't reach that? Because I thought my life was ruined. I thought that I would never be of any use to the kingdom again. My dad thought his life was ruined, that he would be of no use to the kingdom again. Lies. Lies from the enemy of our souls. And I know that Satan is telling so many of you in this room that there's no hope for your situation, that there's no forgiveness for what you've done, that, that the sin that you're in the middle of, that you can't get out of it, that there's no way out. And I want to speak life, and I want to speak truth over you, and I want to tell you that those are lies from Satan. And I want you to know that our God, the high king of the universe, wants to bring wholeness to your life. I heard someone say one time, openness is to wholeness as secrets are to sickness. And it's absolutely true. You know, the Bible tells us in James, in the uh, fifth chapter and in the 16th verse, it says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. And you think, okay, now if I confess my sins to the Lord, that's enough. I can keep this secret going. You know, it's, it's between he and I. And I'll repent, and I'll put it down, and I'll put it away. But I want you to know that there is power in confessing that sin to someone else. There is healing in confessing that sin to someone else. Because God can bring truth into your life and into your heart through that. It might not be your secret sin. It might be your secret pain. There are some of you who are sitting here who've had things done to you, not by you. And you've kept that secret. I am asking you today to first go to the foot of the cross, to ask the Lord to forgive you for whatever it is whatever sin it is that you think is so deep that he can't forgive. And then I'm also asking you to go to someone and confess that sin to them. Accountability is so huge for the Christian. Accountability helps us encourage one another. And when you're struggling and that sin comes back, you've got somebody else that you can go to and you can say, can you help me through this? Help me get through this. You know, and they can speak that truth into you. If it's so deep and so dark, you feel like, and you think, I can never tell someone I know that, I'm asking you to find one of us in a blue shirt. Find me. Find somebody else. And confess that sin. Just say, I, this is what I'm struggling with. Will you pray for me? My name's, you know, whatever. And we will do that. But I want you to know, and what I want you to take away from this is, I want you to remember, first of all, that our God is a God who loves you infinitely and deeply and overwhelmingly more than you can ever even begin to think or imagine. 
And He wants to take you and make you whole from whatever it is that you think has put you in so many pieces that it can never be put back together. He is a good, good Father. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you beyond words for what you've done in my life, how you've redeemed me from the pit. Lord, you have done just like in Psalm 18, verse 16, where it says that you reached down and you took a hold of me and you drew me out of deep waters. And Lord, there are people within the sound of my voice right now who are in deep waters. And so, Father, I am asking you to come down from on high and draw them out. Take them, Father, by your hand. Draw them out of these deep waters, Lord, that they would know your wholeness and your redemption and your forgiveness, and that this day, April 6th, Father, would begin a new day in their life, a new day of new beginnings, and that you would start a new work in them right now, Lord. We are so grateful for your love and your presence, and I praise your name, Jesus, and I thank you for your love. In your name we ask it. Amen.